Let this not just be a song that we sing, but a reality that we are living in. That your kingdom will come and take over in our lives and our fears. That we will be living ambassadors of the kingdom on the earth. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We we'll give you praise, Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit, we ask you to take over now. Take over my mind, take over my thoughts, and take over my mouth and minister your word and your truth to your people. And take over the hearing of your people. Take over their understanding. That they will hear what you are saying and understand it. And walk in the reality of it. Online, on ground, no distance in the spirit realm, we thank you. We give you praise, we give you glory. That the spirit of faith will break through. Let doubts clear up. Let fear go. Amen. We thank you for an open heaven already. We shut down every distraction of the devil, Amen. every lie of the devil, Amen. every conflict of information. We take authority over it. That the truth of the word of God will prevail. Amen. And we thank you. And you confirm your word with signs and wonders following it. And thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You may be seated in Jesus' name. That song is a very powerful song. Let your kingdom come. What do we actually mean when we say let the kingdom come? What does the Lord Jesus Christ mean when he said let the kingdom come? Thy kingdom come. And when the kingdom has come, what takes place? How do we get to that place? as a child of God. That's part of what we are looking at. When you are not living by earthly limitations. We are living your life by the kingdom power that is available at your disposal. There are many pictures that um, give us an idea of that. But not all of them don't capture the full truth of it, but at least they'll give you an idea of it. Um, how many of you have gone to the British Embassy in Nigeria or the American Embassy in Nigeria before? Anybody? You've gone to a, maybe you went for a visa or something like that. Now you know that that particular building is on the soil of Nigeria. But by being the embassy of another country, it is under the jurisdiction of another country. You know that? Huh? If a particular person has offended in Nigeria and the, law, the policemen in Nigeria, they are looking for him, and he runs inside that building and they allow him to stay. They can't enter that place to go and arrest him. It will lead to crisis. Even though he's, the building is on the soil of Nigeria, but it's under the jurisdiction of another country. You understand that? Praise God. That's a picture. When Jesus said, you are in the world, but not of the world, that gives you an idea that you are in the world, but you are supposed to be under the jurisdiction of another government. Spiritually, in your experiences. But that is not the way that many people look at their Christian life. So what we are looking at in this particular series is how to get to that place where we are operating the kingdom life. I hope you got that picture. That something can happen to any other person, 
does not mean it should happen to you. I hope you understand that. And then number two, the, the um, American ambassador or the British ambassador in Nigeria, I'm sure he does not collect his salary in Naira. How many of you know that? Huh? Praise God. How many of you know that, know that the fuel subsidy remover does not affect him? Are you sure? Huh? Good. <laughs> That's very interesting. And the Bible says you are ambassadors of Christ. So write it down. You are an ambassador of a kingdom. Now, if, if you can use that picture to try to understand how you are, your life is supposed to be, then you can understand Philippians chapter 4 and verse um, 19 better. My God shall supply all your need according to what? According to, uh -uh, talk to me, according to his riches where? It's not according to the economy of the country you are in, but according to his riches in glory. That's what the Bible says. So how do you now walk in the reality of that? That's part of why we come to church and we spend time looking at the word of God. That if this man is an ambassador of another country, his lifestyle in our midst is determined by the resources of the country that is representing. You understand that? Okay. But now you know that um, you are not likely to find the American ambassador going to Niger Delta or um, Zamfara State in a public vehicle. Huh? You know that. Uh, he, 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 he will be careful what he does and what he doesn't do depending on the situation on ground now if anything happens to him they, if if um, if 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 this um, kidnappers let us imagine they mistakenly kidnap the american ambassador how many of you know that there's going to be trouble huh hello uh -huh. I'm sure the man does not worry about kidnapping. He's not going to expose himself carelessly, but that is not one of his worry. Amen. Because his protection, his deliverance will be determined by the government that is representing. And I want you to have that at the back of your mind that... Um, these truths are there, but they don't necessarily mean they are ruling in your life. Is that okay? That they are true does not mean it is active in your own life. It must become active in your life. That's what we want to happen. That's, where, that's when Christianity becomes a powerful force in your life. Do you get that? So that you don't worry about things that scare other people knowing that there is a protection that god has for you during covid that time and then um, african government didn't have much provision on ground and you found out that foreign governments from europe from america they started sending planes to carry their citizens from nigeria how many of you remember that time huh? and there are nigerians that had american visa and british visas they started traveling. You remember that time? And then those governments did not leave their citizens in jeopardy of what was going on here. They were responsible enough to send a rescue operation for their citizens. And I remember during COVID, what the Lord said to me to tell his people, is that those governments are not more responsible than his own government. How many of you remember I said that to you? That he has a provision for his people. Okay? I must never forget that, that while you are a citizen of Nigeria, you are also a citizen of the government of heaven, of the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is more responsible than earthly kingdoms. Sometimes, 
when you are part of an earthly government or kingdom or nation that is responsible and serious, your, 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 your dependence or awareness of God is not very strong. You are more aware of your government. They are taking care of that. You don't worry. You just expect that. And government is there. They are going to do all that. Okay? But when you are a citizen of a government or a country where there is not that much sense of responsibility and seriousness about their citizens, you tend to depend on extra provision. If you don't have God, you will look for something else to help you. All right? But if you do have God, you tend to pray. That's why in Africa you find a lot of people pray. But most people pray, but they don't really understand their relationship with God. And that is why we must settle now and get an understanding of our relationship with God. Do you get what I'm saying? That somebody said something is going to happen does not necessarily it's going to, it, it, it may happen, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen to you. Do you understand? Praise God. Uh, and um, I am I'm taking this series of teaching with a mindset to help you come into that kind of um, understanding of your position with God. Not with the mindset of, um, oh, that is working for the man of God alone. Do you get that? You know, that's the a, that's a law of the devil that people get. But it's only the man of God that that can work for. I, I'm, I'm dealing with things that is God's provision for everybody. Is that okay? Praise God. All right. I remember many years ago at Elisha, one Sunday like that, a pastor in town, another pastor in town, his, his, his name and that ministry, ran to our church. And then he told me that they said there are certain things that is going to happen and that people should begin to pray. So I told him, I said, well, I don't know where you get that information from, but um, God sent me to town here. And he didn't tell me that's going to happen. So you can go back to your church. I'm sure it's not going to happen. If it's going to happen, God will tell me about it. Uh, he said, are you sure? I said, sure, I'm sure. And then, are you not going to pray? No, I'm not going to pray about it. It's not every prayer point that you should pray about. Do you understand? So the pastor went back to his church. Nothing like that happened. Now, I was just acting on the fact that I didn't send myself to town. God sent me there. And God will not allow anything to happen to me. I know God is responsible enough. How many of you have your children that go to school? Let me see your hand up. Your children go to school? It's very little children. If while you are in church, now let's say this is um, school time, and you just hear that um, some crisis is happening in schools in town. They didn't mention the school that um, there's some outbreak of violence in primary schools in town and some people are attacking children how many of you here will get up and do something about it let me see your hand up uh, raise your hand raise your hand including that i'm preaching <laughs> uh? <laughs> now you understand why well, what i was going after is the fact that if you are that responsible and then protective over your children, how on earth do you think God will be sleeping if any trouble is coming to you? Because you are not going to sit down, even though you are in church and I'm preaching, you will get up. And then if I say, everybody, wait, don't worry, there's no problem. <laughs> you are going to, some of you will just start running. And then you want to get to the school, and there is only one person that is on your mind. I mean, who is the person? Huh? Talk to me. If you get to the school and you see your neighbor's child, will you take your neighbor's child first of all? You are looking for one particular person. Huh? Can you can you relate that to the scripture in Psalm ninety-one that says he has given his angels charge concerning concerning who? Let me see your hand up. Sure. So if an angel is looking to save anybody in this town, who is he looking for? Are you very sure? 
All right, so we are ready for today's teaching now. <laughs> now, I, I want that to settle in your heart. But the, the key point that uh, I want to deal with today is the word persuasion. All right? So, now can you put um, the six zones of life back on the screen for me, IT? I'm teaching on that now. I'll go over it a little bit. You remember we dealt with the comfort zone last Wednesday. Is that correct? Huh? Answer properly. You are in class. <laughs> Amen. When I go to DIC to talk there, I say, did you get that? I say, yes, sir. <laughs> so when I say, did you get that? Yes, sir. Uh -huh, good. <laughs> Amen. All right. So I want you to focus on the word persuasion. So while we go to uh, uh, I'm, I'm dealing with zone one and zone two. Okay? All right? This is zone three, zone four, zone five, I hope, or zone six, zone five. You see, not the definition of the zones. Huh? Zone one is what? Comfort zone. Zone two is what? Zone three is what? All right, zone three is here, is it? Okay, zone three is up. This is crisis zone. Zone four is victory zone. Uh, 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 uh. All right, so let me draw this. I want to put something here for you. There's another line that can go from here. Because you can be in the victory zone and go back to the crisis zone if you are not careful. Is that okay? So let's... Um, get all those points clear and then the zone five zone six is um this de dead zone zone five is safety zone is that okay now our goal is that your journey will be zone one zone two zone three and then you go to zone four and zone five right Amen. not go up here Okay, so currently I want, I'm focusing on zone one and zone two, what you should do there. Everybody will get to these two zones. You understand that? Okay, uh, where, wherever you go after zone two will be determined by what happens in zone one. Do you understand that? Zone two is combat zone. Everybody gets there in one way or the other. And... Um, you want to get there with an advantage. You don't want to get there disadvantaged. Most human beings find themselves in zone two with a disadvantage. They are not prepared for it. They don't want it, but they don't prepare for it. So I want you to write down the word preparation. How many of you remember I told you in zone one, Three things you must do. What is the key word last, last Wednesday? Eh? Stock up. Lay up. Is that correct? Eh? Lay up. Stop. Or stock up. These are statements that are in the Bible that people gloss over. 
And I told you three things you must talk up. You can remember them? Number one, promises. Number two, knowledge. Eh? And practice. Promises, knowledge, and practice. That is what we said you should do in that place. Is that correct? All right. So let's look at um, scriptures to support what we are learning. Um, how many of you are in church on Sunday? Huh? How many of you are blessed? Huh? I tell you, many people want that kind of service every day. <laughs> but this is Wednesday. Not Sunday. So, I want you to look at um, Luke chapter 12. And look at a man that found himself in the zone of death 24 hours. Okay? And um, I'll look, I'll, I'll read it to you from verse 1. Because in the comfort zone of life, there's no trouble as it were in the immediate. But anything can happen, good or bad. And that is when you prepare. A wise man prepares for the future. He prepares against negative circumstances. He, just, he does not just hope that everything will continue as it is. But most people don't prepare. I want you to be among those that prepare. Is that okay? So, this man in Luke chapter 12, we read from verse... Um, 13 and one of the company said unto him master speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me that's what was bothering this man the inheritance that their father left and the older brother has camped it and is looking for somebody to intervene that they should divide the inheritance all that Jesus was saying in that meeting, the man was not listening to it. That was what was in his heart. I hope you're following what I'm saying. Now, as you're sitting down here now, only God, yourself, and the devil know what's in your heart. I hope you're following what I'm saying. Nobody knows what's in your heart until you begin to speak. And not just any kind of speak. There are two kinds of speaks, uh, speaking, speaking that we do, or speeches. One is the public relations speech, where you want people to think of you in a particular way. The other one is the real life communication that you are doing. Is that okay? So when, when the one that comes from your heart is the real life situation. You have had somebody pray, and they, they come to church, they hear a good teaching, and then they get back home, and he's making negative statement. And maybe the wife or the husband say, that's a negative statement. Look, I can't, I can't lie. We are, not, we are not talking faith now. We are talking reality. How many of you have ever said that, or somebody has said it around you? We are not talking faith now. We are talking reality. So faith was not in his heart. It was in his mouth in church, but not in his heart. So he's talking what is in his heart now. Do you understand that? Good. So until you speak what is in your heart, we don't really know what is in your heart. But now look at this man. They were in a meeting where Jesus was teaching. And what was on, in his heart was that this, my brother cannot be cheating me. He can't take all this inheritance and just be sitting on top of it. Uh, who, can, who, will, who will help me? And all that. So go to verse 14 now. And Jesus said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, now, he knows, the, the Lord Jesus Christ knows what is going on here, so he's not talking to everybody. He had answered the man and using that situation to teach everybody. And said, take heed. Everybody said, take heed. 
That is, watch, pay attention. Don't be careless as far as this matter is concerned. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. I want you to write that down very carefully. If your life consists of the physical things that you have, you are a very poor man. Are you following what I'm saying? Take for example, there are some times that um, people travel. You understand? Sometimes you find church members travel. After a program, they are going from here to Lagos, to Abuja, to Portacourt, different places. And occasionally they call back. And sometimes in the night, maybe 9, 30, 10 p.m., a car had a problem. And the car, they, they are about six people in the vehicle. And, um, and they, are, they are trying to fix the vehicle to do whatever and things like that, 9, 30. And then maybe they call back. And then, so they talk, they call me. I said, okay, is this something that can be fixed within some minutes? Ah, I don't think it can be fixed easily. Where are you? We are, we are between Onigari and um, Ogiri on the way to Lagos. And that's a very, not a very safe spot and all that. Okay. And then, okay, maybe somebody will go to Ibado or whatever and things like that. So I said, okay, no problem. Can you get a vehicle that can carry every one of you? Yes, sir. But um, we need somebody to stay with the vehicle. I said, no, let the vehicle carry every one of you. Lock the vehicle and leave the place. Okay? Now, I've found this to be true almost every time. The brother that owns the vehicle is the one driving. His wife is there, and then some church members that he carried. He doesn't want to leave the vehicle. So I said, leave the vehicle and carry and go. And then sometimes we call somebody from Barnum and say, Pastor, you get up, get on the road and go and carry those people from that place. All right? If you get a mechanic, okay, if you don't get a mechanic, the first thing, just take the people away from the place. And then you see the reluctance. Now that tells me that that car is one of the possessions of the man. As far as he's concerned, his life is not as important as the car. I'm here. The calculation I've made is that the worst that's going to happen is that that car is stolen. We can raise money and buy another car for him. But there's no way that if robbers attack them there or something bad happened to them, we can replace anything that's happened. That's my calculation. And every pastor understands that, that the first thing I tell a leader when you are leading people anywhere is that make sure you take the people to safety. The car is not as important as the people. All right? But that is based on the principle of Jesus. Are you following what I'm saying? I don't have anything physically on this planet that is so important to me that I will risk my life for it. That does not mean I'm careless about it. I hope you are following what I'm saying. But the first thing that you must deal with is what does your life consist of? I'll go again to, to show you this because it's very important. True wealth is not in anything you can tangibly carry around as it were. Your true wealth must be in something intangible. Knowledge. Relationship. The anointing. Wisdom. I don't know what man they said, maybe Mr. Ford or something years ago, I don't know if it's a true story, but you know, people say that it, it happened. And they said, if you lose everything you have, what's going to happen? You say, I can get it back. Because all I have is not in what, is, what you see, is in my knowledge, in what I know. That is a truly wealthy person that separates what he has from what he knows. He knows that what he has physically came out of what he knows. Do you understand that? I hope, how uh, many of you understand that? Huh? I was talking to people on Sunday. 
that um, my obedience to the call of God in my life produced different things that we call the ministry. When the ministry started, what we had was a sheet of paper that, and God said, this God said, it does say the Lord. We wrote all things down. This is what the Lord said. This is what I'm going to do. This. I'm, there are still things on that sheet of paper that has not been done, but it's going to happen. And it's becoming buildings, pieces of um, things, different things and all that. So that knowledge is really in my heart. Are you following what I'm saying? It has nothing to do with the um, title of pastor, evangelist, or whatever, and all that. It has to do with a calling that is invincible. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Praise God. Okay? And um, so if people ask me and said, they asked me to come and do this. I said, did God call you to do that? No, people are asking me to come and do it. I said, did God call you to do it? If God didn't call you to do it, he can't back you up. There's, no, there's, no, there's not going to be any divine activity that's going to generate any divine result. I hope you're following what I'm saying. For example, one of the testimonies on Sunday, a sister in the church sent a testimony to mommy today. On Sunday, she, she had asthma. And then she forgot her inhaler at home. And while the service was on, she was coughing seriously. And then when I started ministry under the anointing, she was completely healed. And she's been free of that since that time. Sent a testimony today. A brother in Canada, one of our brothers, at, when we traveled, he told me, he said himself and his wife, and said that he's been having problems. He's been applying for jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs. They've just been rejecting him. We don't need you. 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 And then on Sunday, he was present in the service when that decree came that uh, your matter will be reviewed. And the favor, the designer decided design your favor. And said, This company that they gave him, a, they called him last a month ago, they told him that not needed. In the middle of the night, they called him and said, You should send the CV. And they told him that they reviewed the procedure overnight and they decided that he's their preferred candidate. And they get now listen to him. They called him and gave him a job with six figures. Now, what I'm saying is this. All that is divine activities that is generated by obedience to a divine call. All the things I said under the, in the meeting, anybody can cram it and go and repeat it. It won't have the same result. When Moses stood before the Red Sea and he cried, and God said, why are you crying to me? Stretch your rod and tell the people to go forward. And the Bible says God blew with his nose tree, and then the, the, the Red Sea parted, and the children of Israel went on dry ground. The Egyptians attempting to do the same, they drowned. Because that divine activity did not include them. I hope you follow what I'm saying. And I think one of the, one of the most, do I call it stupid? I'll call it insane activity that is going on in the world today is this attack against the ministers of the gospel and say well we're the same and things like that 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 is not a new thing they did it in the days of moses aaron and um datan kura and abiram and moses said okay all of you that you said you are the same come bring all your stuff and put it in the ark of the covenant by this time tomorrow the person that god has chosen he will show and by tomorrow, these are dried, dead stick. By tomorrow, the stick of Aaron had produced fruit, living fruit, almond fruit, everything, blossom with flowers and everything. And from that day, nobody argued again.